This is my first talk as a Mozilla employee because I left Yahoo last week and I now I'm officially the principal evangelist for HTML5 in Mozilla. Uh, the last time that I built games was actually on Commodore 64. And that was an assembly language and you had like these 160 pixels to play with and I realized back then that you have to be very clever to make really cool games and really good looking games. And luckily enough we don't have to, we don't have to worry about that anymore. People for years have been telling that the web is not good for games, we need different platforms, we need to build in like a uh, world of environments and it's not the case anymore because with HTML5 we have the things to play with. But let's go back to when I started to be, to be a developer. There was a war going on. And the war was actually about what is the coolest toy. And there were two uh, fractions actually talking to each other. And one of them was like, uh, Playmobil is fucking awesome. Because that's about like, yeah, little, that's why you have all the things, the cars and things are ready. And of course, the other one said like, Lego is the really cool thing. Yes. Probably those that later on became developers and had, didn't have a social life. <laughs> and with Lego, is, uh, with, with Playmobil is really cool because they were already built. And they were actually quite sturdy. So basically when you had like a motorcycle or a boat, they would actually swim and they would actually be in the dirt, they wouldn't crash. But uh, when you build a boat with Lego, it would actually sink because there's like these little gaps between all the stones which are rather annoying. But the problem with, with, with it was that um, with Lego, you had the building blocks to put it together. So you actually, you build something and you play with it. So it was less sturdy, but it was actually pretty cool because you made this thing. You didn't just buy it and had it and you showed off to the other kids like, I can read these instruction booklets, this is pretty awesome. So, the components actually, if it's made up of components rather than being a, a single toy, gave you flexibility. So when you were bored of the ship or the motorcycle or the, uh, the, the car in Playmobil, your parents bought a new one, which is great for Playmobil, which is bad for the parents, which is bad for the toy because the toy doesn't get played with anymore. We all saw Toy Story and like, oh. And um, it was actually good. Uh, it was actually not good for the kid either, because the kid just realized really early on that you buy things and discard them, rather than buy things and change them and do something to them. And this is why when you got bored with the uh, with the truck here, you actually just reassembled it into a race car, or you reassembled it into a DeLorean car that you just saw on television. And that was possible. And that's the cool thing with web technologies right now as well. Rather than having bespoke uh, executables and like software that is like fixed in one space, you can fix, you can change this thing quickly by changing the source, by live in the browser editing it and trying it out. You also learn that way. I learned game development on Commodore 64 by cracking games. I wrote my own games and later on I wrote my own protection systems because I was the one that worked around the old ones. And the same happens on the web. Everything is available as source. And that way you can learn from other people's uh, um, mistakes and learn from other people's successes. So the thing that people always say about the web is that bespoke development gives you better technology access. Like we don't have accelerometers, we don't have camera access, we don't have address book access in HTML5 and these kind of things. Which is true for now, but we're working on all of these things. But the question is also like, does it make your game really better? Is it more interesting because you put all the features in there? When I install something on my Nexus, and it's a game that is Tetris and it asks me for my address book access, why the hell would it need my address book? Because they already ask it up front because later on they might need it in four years time. So uh, take for example Cannibal, the Cannibal, the game. That was just a really fast game that you just press the space bar or a button to jump. That was how easy it was. And there is a great website out there at the semisecretsoftware.com where they actually told you how they changed it from this web game to an iPhone game and had the same performance. So instead of just building a massively complex game, people build simple games but put a lot of effort into them and share the knowledge that they learned by, while building it because they want everybody else to build cool games as well. And that's the first time in the game industry. If you build something for PlayStation 2, you had to buy an SDK from Sony and you weren't allowed to build anything without spending a lot of money. It's like pay to play mentality, like in America when you're a band. And that's just stupid because people should just be able to build things and with the web you can. And Cannibal was quite cool, but it really became really aw uh, awesome when it turned into the Robot Unicorn Attack game, which is actually a game that would, uh, that would make uh, like some people question their sexuality if you play it long enough. <laughs> and uh, it's quite funny when people say simple games and like they, they, they're not complex. And this is a wonderful website about Pac-Man and explains to you the artificial intelligence in Pac-Man how every single uh, ghost works, where they go, how to predict where they go, and how much effort went into writing Pac-Man. 
So let's talk about let's talk about Angry Birds, which I just uh, I finished once, then I bricked my Nexus by putting my apps on my on my card, which was a bad idea, and then I played it again all the way through because it's a cool game. And I mean the cut the rope one, this is even better. Those guys really know how to make games because they're in Finland and snowed in half the time or something. I don't know, but it's just such a uh, uh, it's such an impact on the web right now and the whole media as well. I mean, there are like viral videos. I mean, if you've seen this one, like it's the peace treaty between the birds and the and the pigs, and that one is going wild on YouTube right now. They have these meetups about Angry Birds. There's one coming up in London, and I mean, it's like it's it's just manifesting a stereotype that girls are birds and men are pigs. It just doesn't work, and he should explode when he kisses her. But it's fair enough. So it's a it's a phenomenon that actually works. But the thing is, uh, it's not open yet. And to me, it's like I played Angry Birds and I finished it the first time, and I wanted to play. I wanted to write my own levels. So I basically said, like, okay, Rovio guys, do you have a level editor in the making? And they actually answered that they thought about it several times, but they hadn't done it yet. Where uh, Angry Birds an HTML5 game, people could write their editor themselves and actually can send it back to Rovio and actually become a developer for them or whatever. Instead of just now, we have to wait for them to do it. So the web already does a lot of stuff for Angry Birds. If you get stuck, most of the time what you do is you actually go to YouTube and you find out if somebody had done the, the, uh, the solution already. And I've done that three times, I admit it. But uh, it's just wonderful that people share this information, mostly to show off, but that's what the web is for. And there's a number of things that Angry Birds could do in the web as well, if it were a web application or even an HTML5 application that get rendered out to iPhone and Android. Things that it doesn't do right now. It could be, for example, multiplayer. Why couldn't I be the guy that builds the fort with the pigs and the other guy has to be the bird to kill my fort? And then we all each get points and there's a score card and so on and so forth. It makes it more interesting. Why can't I change the order of the birds, which sometimes drove me crazy? I don't want to have these four white birds that are totally pointless before I go to the black one. Comments and hints would be another thing. What people do now on YouTube could be in the game itself, if it were, if it were on the web. Uh, voting and indexing levels by frustration level. If I just want to play a quick game on the, uh, on, the tra on the train, I don't want to get stuck for 20 minutes on one level. I just want to play one simple level and then go for the, for the harder ones. If I'm already an expert, I go for all the expert levels. That could be done by people rather than by the same itself. And of course, fan built levels. HTML5 brings higher fidelity to the web, so we don't even have websites. We now have access to video and audio. And it also, uh, it does it without sacrificing the core ideas or principles. It's sharing, it's being open, it's view source, you can actually execute and, uh, and access everything on the page. And viral and linked nature of the web comes as free add-ons. You put something on the web, these things will happen. People will build on top of your stuff. Um, simple upgrades and patches, so if there's a problem, you can actually simply upgrade it without asking people to download the whole game again and reinstall it. And you have easy reuse of code in wall of environments, because you can write in HTML5 and then render it out with phone gap onto mobile phones or put it in Facebook or whatever. And also we should reuse code from other people. Seb is here, who is an amazing Flash developer, and as it's JavaScript in HTML5, they solved a lot of problems that we're trying to solve right now. So hug a Flash developer and ask them how they solved problems four years ago, because that's what we're facing right now. And all the documentation in HTML5 is free. I don't have to go to a training course to use the SDK of Sony. I can do that on the web. And so just pick, connect, and play. Just build your own little race cars with HTML5 rather than waiting for the one that gets built for you and you have to pay a lot of money for. And that's all i got time for, so thank you very much. I love the idea of being able to like, rewrite people's code and play with stuff, like you said about Lego. But what do you think of like compilers and minifiers where actually that makes the code very obfuscated and hard to understand? It's a necessity because the web is slow, as it is right now, and we have non-browsers in use still. And, uh, uh, but to me, the whole view source argument should happen somewhere else. I mean, you should release a free version of your stuff on GitHub, unminified, and have a, have a, uh, have a build process turned into a minified version. So trying to uh, reverse engineer what people have done in a packed code is pretty much pointless. And uh, it's just an, a necessity in terms of uh, performance. But uh, most of the stuff that I've seen is actually available as source code as well. So the real new view source to me is on GitHub or SVN or Google Code or wherever I want to put it and not in the browser because when it comes to, uh, when it comes to websites and not necessarily games, the problem is also that a, a good building pro build process 
renders out a different HTML and JavaScript and CSS for Internet Explorer 6 than for other browsers, than for browsers. And uh, that means that you, you actually, you see a snapshot of this view source for that browser and your environment and not the real view source. So um, we have to uh, get away from that learning by just copying and pasting from other people's source code and just talking to the guys that build the things in, in itself. What's your views on processing.js? What's my view on processing.js? Yeah, processing is like obviously the JavaScript, like a Java, and there's a JavaScript version as well of like an open source kind of editor. Yeah. That allows you to build stuff and even download your stuff as well. Yeah. So what's your views of that versus like Canvas? I think it's a performance thing. Um, personally, I like Canvas a lot, but it's to me a bit of like, um, you know, it's like a applet reloaded. It's a black box inside your browser with an API. So that's what Flash gave us as well in a, in a much less good API, but and not as open. But um, I've played with processing JS before. Um, I have to say it's a, it's a very clever tool, but I want to see it perform as well as Canvas before I actually say, use this or use the other. But the same is like SVG versus Canvas. So Canvas is great, but for keyboard access, it's a very, very bad solution, whereas SVG gives you all the benefits that you have there. Um, open sourcing and being able to look at other people's code and build stuff on top of it. What if I'm, say, Sega, and I want to build a game with HTML5, but I don't want people I want to be able to sell access to it or something. I don't want people to be able to take that code, shove it on another website. And well, it's, it's the classic case of like, what, how do I protect my code? You know, it's like, I mean, I, I learned it by working around these restrictions of other companies. Nowadays, it's much harder because the machines, are, the, the software is much more complex. I mean, obfuscation and minification works there. People will, uh, uh, I mean, when it comes to piracy, the most, the biggest point is like how heavy or how expensive do you make it for the pirates to go there, and is it really worthwhile cracking an HTML5 game when cracking something that it comes on a CD or a DVD brings you much more money if you're a legal person? So um, I think it's there is there's ways to protect these kind of things. There's ways to to uh, in, especially in the newer JavaScript coming up, you will also be able to uh, to actually put a DRM style si a signature in your code before it can be executed, that's another option of doing that. But you can always reverse engineer things. It's like saying, uh, uh, you put watermarks in your photos, but I can always take a screenshot of your photo and then use it. That's what computers are doing for us. It actually gives you the things. Um, my favorite was about games when it comes to 3D objects, and people were saying like, okay, you can't steal our 3D objects because in the code, we actually obfuscate them and, uh, and, uh, and encrypt them. And somebody just wrote, just wrote a, a Arduino board that goes on top of your graphics card. And when, it, when your 3D object goes to the graphics card, it has to be unpacked. So basically, that's where they got the unpacked and unencrypted 3D objects from. So there's always a way around if you, if you just have enough, have enough people trying to fight it. And that's all I got time for, so thank you very much.